Our lesson this week is part two of Esther's story, where in our Sunday school lesson last week, we saw where her cousin, Mordecai, encouraged Esther to, to step out, to, to move in faith. As I said in last week's lesson, faith, it is not enough for you to simply say that you are a believer. It's not enough to, for you to say that you believe in God, that you were baptized, or that you are a born again believer. It's not enough for you to profess your faith. That is something that you have heard me say all year long now. It's not enough for you to say that you are a Christian or that you are a child of God. Faith, it moves, it has to move. Again, if you are paralyzed in fear, that spirit can lead to a spirit of doubt that would cause you to, to sit down. But faith, it wants to move forward. And you and I as believers, we must have the courage to step out on faith putting all of our trust in the Lord. That's something that I said in last week's sermon. And so at the end of our Sunday school lesson last week, we saw where Esther, through and by the encouraging words of her cousin Mordecai, she moved by faith, putting her trust in the Lord. And she said that if she goes before the king and if she loses her life, so be it, she was going to move on behalf of her people. And so what was it that had happened? That's what we pick up here on in here in our Sunday school lesson this week. We're there in the eighth chapter of Esther and the third verse. We'll see that our lesson, it opens up with Esther falling down before the king and imploring him with tears to counteract the evil of Haman's desire to wipe out the Jews. Haman, we should remember, he had a desire to wipe out all of the Jews, all because Mordecai did not pay him homage. Mordecai did not bow down to him. And so that man was filled with so much evil and so much wickedness that he went to the king to have a decree made so that he could wipe out all of the Jews. And so Mordecai, again, he encouraged his cousin, go before the king and, and plead not on just my behalf, but plead on behalf of all of the Jews. And so we'll see here that Esther, she went before the king. And we're told there in the fourth verse that the king held out his golden scepter towards her and she went to stand before him to make her case, to plead on behalf of the people. We have to remember that going before the king outside of her ordained time was something that had terrified Esther. It's why she was initially hesitant about going before the king because this was a life or death situation. If you went before the king, before the king had set the time for you to go before him, there was a law that would end your life. It was a life or death predicament, a life or death situation for Esther. And so again, we see where Esther, she put that aside, she put her fears to the side, she moved with boldness, she moved with courage to go before the king. And we'll see here, that Esther, she did not lose her life. In fact, the king holds out that golden scepter before her so that she could go and plead her case to him. And so we'll see there that as she stood before the king, Esther, she makes her plea. She said to the king, if I have found favor in your sight, let it be written to revoke the letters devised by Haman. She asked then, how can I endure to see the evil that will come to my people? Or how can I endure to see the destruction of my countrymen? Now, all of us, we know that Esther's countrymen, we know that her people, we know that her heritage was that she was a Jew. However, the king nor his people, they did not know her heritage. They didn't know her nationality, if you will, until after she had become queen. And so, you may wonder, well, how did they not know that she was a Jew? Well, if we go back to the second chapter of Esther and we take a look at the 10th verse, Mordecai had instructed her not to reveal her heritage to the people. It's likely that Mordecai had told his cousin, had told Esther not to reveal her heritage for safety reasons, right? He probably did that for precautionary reasons. Even though Haman certainly had not made that, that decree before Esther had become queen, we have to, to consider the predicament that, that Mordecai and Esther, that the Jews were living in at that period of time. We have to remember that the Jews, that they were living in exile during these days that we're studying here, that they were still living in captivity. Even though they weren't living up under the Babylonians at that period of time, they were living up under the people who had defeated the Babylonians. So again, it's very likely that Mordecai had told his cousin, don't you reveal your heritage 
because he feared what would happen to her. Now, when we get back there to the eighth chapter of Esther, and we take a look at the seventh verse, this verse, it gives us an update on what had become of Haman. We'll see there in this verse that it is revealed that Haman had been hung on Esther and the Jews' behalf because of his evil scheme. Now, this was something that had happened in between the chapters that we skipped from the fourth chapter up to this eighth chapter. If we take a look at the sixth chapter and the second verse, we'll see that by that point, it had been revealed to the king that Mordecai had actually saved his life and that nothing had been done for Mordecai. So after consulting with Haman about what to do for someone who had saved his life, we'll see there in the 10th verse that the king had ordered Haman to do all that he had suggested, but he was to do it for Mordecai. And so this was something that would have been very startling to Haman, this man who had deep hatred for Mordecai, because Haman, he likely thought that the king was talking about doing something for, for him. But it turns out that the king was talking about doing something for, for Mordecai. And so Haman had to parade Mordecai, we'll see there in scripture, he had to parade Mordecai through the streets in celebration. Imagine how this would have made Haman feel. Again, Haman is doing this for a man that he just could not stand, a man that he detested here. And so we'll see over in the seventh chapter and the fourth verse that Esther had prepared a banquet, had prepared a feast that she threw for both the king and for Haman. And at this banquet, at this feast that was thrown for the king and Haman, we'll see that Esther revealed to the king the threat of annihilation that she and her people faced. That was when she initially revealed her heritage, her people to the king. And so the king, when he heard what Esther had said, the king, we'll see there in the fifth and in the sixth verse, he responded, who threatened you? He wanted to know who was a threat to her, who was a threat to her people, and he wanted to know what he could do about it. And so Esther, she pointed to old, evil, wicked Haman. That was the threat. That was the threat against her. That was the threat against her people. So what do you imagine the king would do when someone was threatening his queen's life? Yeah, you guessed right. And we'll see there, the king had Haman hung on the gallows, we're told there in the 10th verse, that very day. So even though he wasn't alive, even though he wasn't living, Haman's decree, it was still one that was alive and well. It was still very active. And so what we're seeing here in our lesson today is where Esther is going before the king about the decree. She isn't necessarily going before the king about Haman's life. Haman, he's already gone. He's already been taken care of, but, but something must be done about this decree where somebody could actually go out and kill a Jew or kill many Jews and say, hey, there's a decree for, for them to be destroyed. And so that's what Esther is now concerned about. And so we'll see there, in the eighth verse that the king had a response for, for Esther about Haman's decree. We'll see that the king, he looked at her, he looked at Mordecai who was there with her, and he said to them, you yourselves write a decree as you please in my name. He even gives them his signet, just as he had done for Haman, so that they could seal the decree that they would come up with, and there be nobody that would be able to stand against them. And so we'll see in scripture the decree that both Esther and Mordecai that they came up with was one that was in support of the Jews, that we'll see the Jews have help from the king and his own army, his own people. They would have the help in defeating all of those that desire to destroy the Jews. So I would say that the Lord, he certainly made a way for, for the Jews. He certainly made a way for the people, right? And I don't want you to, to miss it, that the Lord had made a way through a woman. He made a way through, through Esther. And something that, that I want to share with all of you is something that my dad said a long time ago. There is no such thing as luck when it comes to the Lord. There's no such thing as coincidence when it comes to God. There are, again, many people that look at the book of Esther and they will skip over it 
because they don't believe that God was necessarily active because they don't see his name. They don't see God mentioned in the scripture there, but the Lord was very active in the story of Esther. Esther did not become queen out of a, a random reason. She did not become queen out of luck, nor did she come, become queen by coincidence. The Lord had ordained it. The Lord had called on her to fulfill this role, where in this role, in answering her calling, she was able to, again, serve her people. She was able to even save her people as well. And so when we get over to the ninth chapter, as our lesson now skips over to the ninth chapter and the 18th verse, we see the Jews celebrating. We'll see them celebrating their deliverance from Haman and from, from his evil decree. Scripture it shows us the, the joyfulness of this celebration as it was celebrated with the giving of gifts in the month of Adar, which is between February and March. And we'll see there that Mordecai, that he wrote of the celebration, and we'll see that he then sent letters throughout all the land to all the Jews who were in the land in order to establish among them a feast to celebrate yearly this occasion on the same date. This was to become a holiday for the Jews in which they were to celebrate how they defeated their enemy that sought to destroy them and how out of sorrow there came joy. And again, all of that was done. All of that came forth by the hands of God, by, by the Lord orchestrating. And as I said in last week's sermon, the Lord had orchestrated a battle plan. And we see where Esther, yes, she had to be encouraged. And we'll see there through that encouragement that Esther, she trusted in the battle plan. She executed the battle plan and from executing, from trusting in the Lord, from, from moving by faith, there was joy out of the trial and the tribulation, out of the affliction, the, the trouble that was facing the Jews, there came joy. So something that I want you to take away from our Sunday school lesson this week is something that I preached in last week's message. Trust in God. Always trust in the Lord and know that the Lord, he will deliver you. When you trust in him, when you believe in him, when you put all your faith in him, when you let go of doubt, it, I'm telling you, it is huge. You must let go of doubt. We don't realize just how much doubt holds us back from our joy. The Lord, he has a desire for you. He has a hope for you. And his hope is your joy. His hope for you is your peace. God, he desires to bless you. And so again, I would hope that you would put all of your hope in the Lord and that you would trust in him, that you will let go of your doubts, that you will let go of your fear and that you will move by faith. And again, when you do that, when you move by faith, joy is going to come. If you are in sorrow and you move by faith again, joy is going to come. If you find yourself frustrated, if you find yourself let down, if you again continue to move by faith, joy is going to come. That is again, that's something that I certainly hope that you take away from our Sunday school lesson this week. Something else that I want you to take away from our Sunday school lesson this week is something that again, we have been taking a look at all quarter long. Don't you ever doubt who it is that the Lord can use. God can, and he will use anybody. It doesn't matter if it's a man, woman, boy, or girl. The Lord can use anybody to, to, to save his people. He can use anybody to help his people. He can use anybody to help deliver you from all of your struggles, from all of your troubles. Again, open yourself up to the Lord, put all of your trust in him, and just know that everything will be all right. Thanks for watching this week's Sunday School lesson. I hope that you enjoyed this lesson and I hope that you'll share this lesson with someone somewhere. Be sure that you like this video and if you aren't doing so already, make sure that you're following this channel. Hit the alert bell as well so that you don't miss any notifications for the next video that we share here on the Newfound Faith YouTube channel.